in listen only <clears throat> mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EPA Water Sense Programs. Let's talk about education and outreach webinar. This webinar is being put on as part of the Hotel Challenge Training Series. I'm Laura Wetzel, a supporting contractor to EPA's Water Sense program, and I'll be moderating this presentation today. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce the three presenters you'll be hearing from today. Hosting this webinar is Tara O'Hare with EPA's Water Sense program. TAR currently serves as the Implementation and Commercial Outreach Lead for WaterSense. She's responsible for program operations, partner support, and outreach to commercial and institutional facilities. TAR is currently managing the Hotel Challenge and was responsible for the release of WaterSense at Work, Best Management Practices for Commercial and Institutional Facilities, which you'll hear more about during this presentation. Our second speaker will be Dr. Wesley Schultz, who is a professor of psychology at California State University, San Marcos. Dr. Schultz is an expert in the areas of behavior and attitude change, conservation psychology, and statistics. He has published extensively in these areas with recent books on the psychology of sustainable development, attitudes and opinions, and most recently, social marketing to protect the environment. He has conducted research and served as a technical expert for a range of private and public entities, including the National Science Foundation, Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. Department of Energy, U.S. Department of Justice, the National Institutes of Health, and OPOWER. He joins us today to summarize his work on social norms and the potential for behavior changes among hotel guests. Finally, we'll wrap up the presentation with an informative case study on education and outreach at the Kalalock Lodge in Forks, Washington, presented by Alex Bartoli. Alec is the Environmental Health, Safety, and Interpretive Manager at the Kalalock Lodge, which is located at the Olympic National Park in Washington State. He is also a lead accredited professional in the operations and maintenance area. Let's review a few housekeeping items quickly before we begin. All attendees have been muted to minimize background noise. If you have a question during the presentation, please type it into the chat box on the upper right hand side of your GoToWebinar screen. We'll have a dedicated time for Q&A at appropriate breaks throughout the presentation to answer those questions for you. Lastly, we are recording this webinar for future viewing, and you'll receive an email once it's posted to the WaterSense website. When you do, please feel free to share the recording with any colleagues or business contacts that may benefit from it. Now I'd like to invite Tara O'Hare to review the agenda for today and start us off with an introduction to WaterSense and the Hotel Challenge. Tara? Thank you for those introductions, Laura, and welcome to all of you who are joining us today. As Laura mentioned, I'll start by providing a brief overview of the WaterSense program, the intent of the Hotel Challenge, and some rationale for why you may want to save water at your hotel. Then I'll review some of the various target audiences for education and outreach in hotels, including employees, vendors, and customers, and some tips for talking to each and promoting your hotel's water conservation efforts. We'll include a few specific hotel examples using employee incentives and customer outreach to spur water savings. Dr. Wesley Schultz will then share the results of a study that he conducted on various types of messaging used to get hotel and resort guests to participate in a towel reuse program and which worked best. Finally, Alec will present a case study about Calalock Lodge's success in educating employees, guests, about and guests about various ways to save water in the evergreen state. At the end of the web webinar, I'll review what we've learned, talk about our upcoming trainings, and give you some quick tips to get started on education and outreach in your hotels. For those of you who are new to these calls and may not be familiar with WaterSense, let me give you a brief summary. WaterSense is a voluntary program started by EPA in 2006. We work with a variety of partners to promote water efficiency and to encourage innovation in manufacturing. 
Our end goal is to help organizations and consumers save water for future generations. The WaterSense label, which is displayed here on this slide, provides a simple way for consumers to identify water-efficient products, homes, and programs. To date, more than 11,000 labeled models of plumbing fixtures and irrigation products have earned the WaterSense label. Products receiving the label have been independently certified for water efficiency and performance. In addition to labeling products, homes, and professional certification programs, we try to approach water efficiency from many angles. We've developed best management practices to help commercial and institutional facilities design, operate, and maintain their buildings and landscapes as efficiently as possible. That's here on the Water Sense at Work on your screen currently. And that is our best management practices guide and is the focus of this training series. We also, as I mentioned, have our products, which are very specific fixtures and technologies that it can be used to save water. And then we also work through our partners and other stakeholders to try to start behavior change like we're going to talk about today. This next slide shows all of the residential and commercial products currently el eligible for the WaterSense label. The label is generally reserved for products that use at least 20% less water and perform as well or better than standard models. Since the program was launched, WaterSense labeled products have helped consumers save more than 757 billion gallons of water and $14.2 billion in water and energy costs. As you can see, we have flushing urinals, laboratory faucets, tank type toilets, shower heads, irrigation controllers, and our newest product, the pre-rinse spray valve. We also work closely with Energy Star to include water factors in their specifications where applicable and to consider energy savings in ours. As I mentioned earlier, to help commercial and institutional facilities understand, manage, and reduce water use, we developed WaterSense at Work. This guidebook includes best management practices on water management planning, water use monitoring and education, sanitary fixtures and equipment, commercial kitchen equipment, outdoor water use, mechanical systems, laboratory and medical equipment, and on-site alternative sources of water. Product and equipment specific chapters in each of these main water use areas cover water efficient operation and maintenance, retrofit, and replacement recommendations. WaterSense at Work also includes ideas for enhancing education and outreach in these facilities to promote water savings, as we're talking about today. As most of you know, since you're on the call today, WaterSense launched the Hotel Water Challenge this year to encourage and assist hotels in saving water. As part of the challenge, WaterSense is providing participants with the tools to act, assess water use and savings opportunities, change products and processes to incorporate best management practices, and track water savings. Once your hotel takes the pledge on the WaterSense website, you'll receive emails that include several items to promote your participation, including the participant logo, a signed certificate, and a sample language uh, listing to use in your in-room binders, websites, and guest services uh, television. We currently have over 700 hotels signed up um, as of last week, and we're very excited to have uh, many, many more on board coming soon. Every hotel that takes the pledge will also receive a monthly water saving tip and reminder about these webinars and just basic tips about water savings in general. The training webinar series, including this webinar, reviews water conservation practices that are applicable to hotels, and each training features a case study showing how the, a hotel has implemented specific measures in these areas. In addition, WaterSense recently released our Water Use and Savings Evaluation Tool, or the Water Use Tool, as we call it, which can be used to help hotel managers and facility personnel to identify, evaluate, and prioritize water saving projects. The water use tool and the associated water assessment worksheets are available along with other technical tools on our website to help go through different parts of a facility. The hotel sector is one of the first areas of focus for our commercial and institutional efforts because we believe that there are many opportunities for hotels to reduce water, energy, and operating costs using some of these best management practices. This pie chart shows how water is typically used in hotels. As you see, the top three areas where water is used can also easily be affected by education and outreach around water use and water waste. 
So as you can see, the top three are the domestic restrooms, laundry, and landscaping, which are some of the examples we're going to use today. For those of you that are on this call, you probably don't need much convincing to save water, but since it's important, um, an important part of education and outreach, um, we like to talk about it anyway. So it is always very important to educate hotel management on the need to invest in water efficiency, and some of these main benefits really cover those areas. First and foremost, saving water can help reduce operating costs. Uh, this one is pretty obvious in many areas where water and sewer costs are rising very quickly above the inflation with no signs of slowing down. In addition, saving water can save energy that is often used to heat water and saves water and energy can help to improve equipment efficiency, which often reduces maintenance costs and man hours required for repairs. So that's one of the areas where we find that there are two for one savings because you are saving both water and energy at the same time. While reducing your bottom line, saving water can also increase your competitive advantage. Uh, a recent survey by TripAdvisor about, for the Green Leaders program found that 79% of travelers place importance on choosing eco-friendly accommodations. And this is something that's reflected in the over 2,400 or so facilities that have currently um, participated in their Green Leaders initiative, uh, which is expanding rapidly. You can demonstrate leadership in your community by working on water issues and by showing that you're a good actor uh, through the Water Sense Hotel Challenge and other challenges like it. So when we talk about education and outreach, it's important to remember who the target audiences are and how to best speak to each of them. Pretty much everyone in your hotel can benefit from some type of education and outreach about water use and savings. Senior management should be supporting everything that you do. Managers can really drive change through an organization by connecting to performance and sustainability requirements and goals at the corporate level. They can also drive change by continuing to highlight important uh, features and goals throughout the year uh, and rally employees around the different actions. Employees are key because they have a direct experience with all parts of the facility as they're working hands-on on a daily basis. Often the best feedback can come from employees and uh, behavior change is often a lot more successful when everyone is included in the change process from the beginning. So when we're talking about that, that includes facility managers both at the building and corporate level, custodial and maintenance staff and supervisors, landscapers, design contractors, your outdoor maintenance staff or vendor, housekeeping, which plays an important role in laundry and restroom water use, sales and reception staff, who can help spread your water saving message to guests, kitchen crews and wait staff can also save water while providing impeccable service. Also, not, don't forget that if you have vendors, performance requirements can be included in contracts and agreements to drive efficiency. Where appropriate, it's also good to bring guests into the equation. Many green conscious guests or practical people in general appreciate that you're doing what you can to save resources where, you, where they're staying. You may now be in a position where you have to convince your senior management to invest in water saving products or processes. In order to help you with this, we created the water use tool, which I mentioned earlier, which can help calculate potential savings from a variety of projects at your hotel. Armed with the output from this tool, you can seek buy-in from your senior management and prioritize projects. If you want to, them to invest in more efficient plumbing or irrigation fixtures, make sure that you mention that WaterSense label models are independently certified for both water efficiency and performance. This way you can ensure a satisfying guest experience even as you're saving water, energy, and money. There are also another, a variety of ways to enhance your credibility as a green hotel through our Hotel Challenge program and other green challenge or certificate programs that count water efficiency among their criteria. We'll talk about these a bit later. When it comes to educating employees, you all know best how to talk to them and what they will respond to, but we've come across a few rules of thumb that have really helped to work well um, for communicating water conservation priorities to employees in the commercial sector. 
First and foremost, share your hotel's guests, uh, your hotel's goals for saving water with all of your employees, along with the results of your efforts. Many successful hotels have found that employees really care about their actions and how they affect the water supply or the environment. This is especially true in areas where water is scarce. You can hold an event, an uh, environmental event for Earth Day, or develop a green team made up of employees who can tackle a specific project or challenge their peers to save water. Better yet, maybe you can foster a little friendly competition among employee teams to see which areas can save the most water. Do you have a feedback mechanism in place to get ideas from your employees about ways to save water? If not, consider creating a way for them to provide suggestions and also maybe from guests as well. It's also important to reach employees where and how they get the most of your information, your educational information. Posters and break rooms, signs at the point of fixture use, brief educational pieces in their paycheck envelopes, or staff meetings can help spread the word. But don't forget to include all languages spoken by employees. In many cases, it's not even about the, what language the piece is written in necessarily. Um, so if your staff does have literacy issues, in-person trainings and gentle reminders may work best, as well as pictures. And if you are doing a video or a piece with photos, we encourage you not to use stock photos of workers. Um, employees really um, can connect better with the message if they're actually the ones featured in the, in the materials. So it can be a kind of a fun way to incorporate everyone into the experience and um, to really get people to recognize that they're involved and that it's their initiative as well. So sometimes uh, turnover can be high in some of these uh, departments, so just make sure that at each new employee at an orientation training session or refresher training includes some of these water saving behaviors that you want the staff to incorporate. Finally, you shouldn't just hand down rules and make changes in a vacuum. Many of you probably have, re have realized this. Um, but keeping staff informed about your water saving successes along the way and on a regular basis can really help them be engaged. More specifically, here are some activities where you can engage your facility management and maintenance staff. Do you have a leak inspection and reporting system in place? If not, you really should. <laughs> in homes across the United States, we waste more than one trillion gallons of water each year due to leaks, and that's not even counting hotels. Make sure everyone who comes in contact with fixtures knows how and where to report leaks and do your best to fix them as quickly as possible so that they know the system works. Toilet flappers are one of the biggest sources of silent leaks. For just a few dollars, you can regularly replace worn or torn flappers in each toilet to avoid wasting millions of gallons each year. If you're looking for an excuse to inspect these toilet flappers, WaterSense celebrates Fix a Leak Week every year during the third week of March. Make March your, hotel, your hotel's maintenance month and avoid massive water bills from leaking toilets. There are also a variety of products and processes available to help you optimize mechanical systems for water savings, as they have a very large impact on water and energy in most facilities. We have put together a separate webinar entirely on this topic, so we encourage you to look at it and share it with your, your facility or maintenance staff as appropriate. These mechanical and other best practices for operation and maintenance can be found in the WaterSense Work at Work guide I mentioned earlier. In addition, outdoors, it's important to keep your landscape designers informed about the different water saving products, systems, and landscape designs available, which you can find at WaterSense at Work or on our outdoor webinar that we've recorded earlier this year. We also have available WaterSense labeled weather-based irrigation controllers now, which are able to use local weather data to determine when and how to water your landscape effectively. Finally, you should also remind maintenance staff to cover pools when not in use uh, to really help save water losses from evaporation. Your housekeeping staff are really key to saving water in guest rooms. And even if you outsource your laundry services, you can save a lot of water and energy and money by instituting practices that keep water conservation in mind. Make sure that all of your water saving behaviors are included in employee trainings, standard operating procedures, requests for proposals, and other materials and checklists that you're using for housekeeping. Even if you have a towel and linen reuse program in place, it may be time to reevaluate your efforts. 
Are your staff currently trained on taking only the towels on the floor? Touch base with your staff on a regular basis about this. They know, they know a lot about uh, guest habits and they may have ideas about how to improve the program and make sure that it's being implemented correctly. It may also be a good idea to observe housekeeping staff every once in a while while they clean a guest room. Do they flush the toilet before adding cleanser? That's more than a gallon of water wasted with each cleaning and a lot more if you have older toilets. A simple swish with a toilet brush, for example, can prepare the bowl for cleaning and it takes no more time than flushing. Also, if they let the water run while scrubbing the tubs and sinks, it can be a significant amount of water and money down the drain. Last but not least, don't forget the food service operations if you have them. An easy solution for many hotel restaurants um, and other restaurants in general uh, to do in drought prone areas is to only serve water upon request. Um, this is something that's becoming more popular, especially in areas such as California where there is a big significant drought. Um, but there's no reason why anyone can't do this um, because there is a lot of water wasted when people don't actually drink it. And so this way the re a restaurant could save a significant amount of water on guests and the dishes that you have to then wash by incorporating this practice. Another water wasting practice is to thaw frozen food under a steady stream of water. Check with your local health code first, uh, but refrigerator thawing may be a safer way to save water and space in the sink. Many dishwashers also make the mistake of rinsing every dish when commercial dishwashing machines are really designed to handle plates that have been scraped instead of rinsed completely. The same can be said for the water, the food disposal systems, which if left running can often use up to 10 or 20 gallons a minute um, in some areas. So if you have one of those, we encourage you to only use it when needed and to make sure that it's turned off when not in use. Finally, there are a variety of water using kitchen fixtures that use less water and energy, including water sense labeled pre-rinse spray valves, Energy Star qualified steamers, ice machines, and dishwashers. Check out our Water Sense at Work best management practices to learn more and work with your kitchen crew to get on the water savings. We also know that hotel and facility managers such as yourselves and those you work with are very busy people and so are the staff uh, who work to keep the operations running smoothly and the guests happy. That's why it's important to make the information that you provide um, the most helpful uh, to help them improve water efficiency by being very readable, clear, and concise. It's even better when the information for the staff is tailored to the local area. So this is just an example of a piece that was put together um, uh, by the New York City Mayor's Challenge to Hotels um, and the Department of Environmental Protection in New York City, along with the Alliance for Water Efficiency. And this was created to give a short guide to help hotel managers and staff in the Big, Big Apple understand the actions that they can take throughout the facility to save water. And because the guide was developed just for New York, it includes specific helpful information about local requirements and initiatives like reporting, um, but also it gives tips that are applicable everywhere. So I encourage you to take a look at things like this because they can be very useful. Um, you know, they can be reused in pretty much any, um, pretty much any area. Uh, the information is critical, but as our next slide shows us, it's also good to bring in a little fun in the effort. So from one of our previous webinar case studies uh, from Caesars Entertainment, uh, we learned about a very successful program that they have in place to incentivize employees for contributing to the company's water saving efforts. The Caesars Entertainment has a Code Green program that has a policy which it shares with all of its employees as a public pledge to community sustainability, including water. They focus really on the community uh, on communications and employee engagement, including events, rallies, games, quizzes, and contests to teach employees ways to save water. The prizes include gift cards and shirts branded with the Code Green logo, as well as a program known as the Caesars Code Rewards with virtual money or total return credits. Basically, the Code program is where employees can earn credits online for projects that they do at work 
to improve environmental impacts, and also sometimes for projects that they do at home. So they use this as a way to compete against each other, which is obviously a very popular thing to do in Vegas um, at a casino. Um, but it also allows them to have an incentive to really stay engaged in the program and to continue to find ways to improve their environmental in, uh, footprint and reduce water use. So the employees basically get virtual money or re return credits that they can then use towards free stays at other Caesars properties or they can get other rewards. Also, there are opportunities to have a donation made to the employee's charity of choice as well. So these are friendly competitions that can really help give employees a real a stake in saving water and generating the project ideas without breaking the bank. Another Hotel Challenge participant, Wyndham, has worked to keep outsourced companies who provide housekeeping, mechanical, and landscaping staff accountable. This is a difficult area for some, some places where the majority of some of the operations are outsourced and done through third-party vendors. So Wyndham worked to create local green teams to communicate with these companies about sustainability policies. This included laundry and dish detergents, for example, that must be low or no phosphates. Some landscaping services have also signed a pledge to adhere to a list of water management practices. So this was a way for them to really put some boots on the ground and to talk with the vendors as they're there at the facility and encourage these sustainability processes and uh, policies throughout the process. They also encouraged employee feedback through an internal website and a blog that they created. As a result, um, an employee uh, really encouraged everyone to institute a Green Kids program which has been very successful to bring the green messaging to kids as part of the organized activity programs that are already happening at many of Wyndham's sites. So this is something that they were able to incorporate into the programming that they offer for guests and to talk to kids and give them fun workshops and things to do while the parents are staying at, at the hotel, hopefully relaxing. So these efforts have translated actually very well to the hotel's guest experience. And this is shown in a survey that they've recently done with the owners of the Club Wyndham. And this is actually pretty significant that uh, almost, uh, 30, or almost 74 percent of the guests were aware of Wyndham's sustainability practices. And almost 80 percent agree that environmentally, environmentally friendly practices should be part of a Wyndham vacation experience. Um, about 80% as well supported Wyndham sustainability practices, and 65% or so respected Wyndham more as a result of these sustainability practices being so prominent within the facility. Wyndham's example shows us that it can pay off in customer satisfaction to keep water in the top of their mind. There is a variety of ways that you can promote your water savings commitment and successes to guests. First and foremost, make sure that your sales and reception staff know about your efforts to save water and be more environmentally conscious. Salespeople can use your commitment to market to eco-minded customers, and reception staff can encourage guests to participate in the towel or linen reuse programs, especially during times of drought. This helps to show your hotel's commitment to the environment and to the community. For those of you who take the WaterSense Hotel Challenge pledge, there are a variety of tools we make available to demonstrate your commitment to water savings. You can hang this certificate as it's here on the screen, signed by EPA in your lobby, or put the challenge participant logo on your website. As I mentioned, pledge takers also receive sample press releases to announce their participation in local media, as well as sample language that can be used on the websites, um, in the hotel television channels, or in the in-room amenities binders to let guests know about your commitment to water conservation and how they can participate. EPA lists all hotels who take the pledge on our website, but your local area may also have a program to promote facilities that have taken the plunge to reduce water use in the community. Check with your local water utility, which may have partnered with WaterSense in these efforts already. Finally, since your customers are coming from all over the country and beyond, it can really help to think about some of the broader programs that promote green business and ecotourism. Many of these programs give points for water conservation initiatives and include water savings in their competitions or recognition programs. 
This slide includes just a few of these programs that you can participate in to receive support and recognition for your efforts. One of the many prominent ones is the LEAD system, which includes water efficiency criteria for all certified hotels for both existing buildings and new ones. In addition, Energy Star, for example, just announced its fifth annual Battle of the Buildings competition, which includes a water savings component. This year's competition features a team challenge with five or more buildings working together to reduce energy and water use across the company's buildings portfolio. This is one way to get attention on a national level for the work that you're doing um, in your local area or in your building portfolio. And even if you're not up to a national building challenge, there are plenty of other green recognition and support programs in the hospitality industry, including TripAdvisor's Green Leaders Program and the Green Hotels Association. State and local organizations also offer green certifications or lists of committed properties in their area. Check with your local association, tourist bureau, convention and visitors bureau, or other areas for opportunities. And many of our water utility partners are eager to work with hotels on ways to save water in local supplies. So we encourage you to contact them if you're interested because they will most likely be willing to work with you and try to find ways to reduce water use um, all around. Great. Thanks for that overview, Tara. Um, so if you have any questions, please remember that all of you are muted just to reduce background noise during the presentation. So please type your question into the chat box at the right of your screen. So it looks like right now there aren't any questions. So now I'd like to ask Dr. Wesley Schultz to discuss the towel reuse messaging study he conducted in California. Wes? I'm here. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you great. Thank you, Wes. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to everyone who's uh, on the webinar here. Um, I am uh, Wes Schultz. I'm a professor at California State University, and my research really focuses on uh, developing new strategies for promoting conservation and sustainability from a behavioral perspective. So in terms of behavior change, what works, uh, what are the best strategies, and what strategies should we avoid? Uh, and so what I want to do in my time today is to just briefly summarize that there's a lot of good research on this topic and just to briefly summarize some of the, the key findings from that. And then talk about my research on social norms and how we can use social norms specifically in a hotel context to promote behavior change. So when, when I approach conservation, I see conservation as really a behavioral issue, even if we're looking at new technology. So uh, we've seen a lot of the, the water sense programs um, focusing on technologies, but in addition to the technology, getting people to adopt it is a behavior, and getting people to use the efficient technologies in a conservation manner. So when we look at the strategies that have been used historically, uh, what we see are, are largely education-based campaigns, so um, facts and messages and, and figures around um, consumption, uh, around water use, and so forth. Raising awareness around the importance of water conservation or, or water-related issues. Um, and fear appeal. So maybe we can scare people into it. So water is running out, water is short, water is scarce, and so uh, you should do something. Um, we also see values-based messaging. So do it in order to uh, save this resource for future generations or do it for environmental protection. And the research around these is, is really mixed. Um, the, there are good examples of education and awareness um, and value-based messaging that, that can produce conservation, but there are also many examples of um, no change in behavior or, in some cases, even boomerang effects. And one of the themes, if you look across these types of messages, is the, the basic idea that most people are doing the wrong thing. So, 
other people are using more water than they need, other people are wasteful, other people are doing things that are causing this big problem, but you should be different. You should be the exception. And so I have a link here to, to a video example, just one that illustrates this basic theme. I'm not going to pull it up, uh, but on the next slide here, there we go. Uh, on the next slide are some screenshots from that public service announcement. So this was a, a typical uh, one minute long public service announcement by the San Diego County Water Authority, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen similar types of messages in your area, encouraging people to conserve water and encouraging people to use less. And that begins with that top left frame there that shows a single house, a single yard, and sprinklers. And so you hear that of these sprinklers. And then it zooms out in this Google Earth theme, so that top right frame there. So now it moves from just the one house to the neighborhood, and you hear the echoing of multiple sprinklers. And then it zooms out again in this Google Earth theme to the San Diego region, and you hear this cacophony of, of sprinklers. And then at the end is this message, water, save it or lose it. But the basic theme is we're in this issue, we're, we're facing this problem because everyone else is doing the wrong thing, but you should be different. What we know, so if we go to the next slide here, what we know um, from behavioral science is that this message is actually the wrong message to use. That is, people are very much driven by the norms of their community. They're, they're motivated to fall in line with what other people in their group, what other people in their neighborhood or their community are doing. And so messages that say other people are not doing this actually can undermine our long-term success. And so what we wanted to do was to use this social norms idea but framed in a positive direction. So when we talk about social norms in behavioral science, we're talking about an individual's beliefs about the common and accepted behavior in a specific situation. So in essence, it's a person's beliefs about what other people do or what other people value or approve of doing. Importantly, these are beliefs and they're not necessarily the truth. So for example, many of my students at the university believe that all of their peers are getting drunk on Friday night. I mean, the reality is quite different from that. Uh, student alcohol consumption is much, much lower than that, but these normative beliefs that students have really drive the acceptance and prevalence of alcohol consumption. And there's a long uh, history of research on social norms. So we know that they're formed through social interaction, but not exclusively, so we use a variety of cues to determine what is the norm, what is the custom. Um, that these norms exert a powerful influence on behavior, but in this positive direction. So if we think that it is the norm to do something, we're much more likely to do it ourselves. That it's particularly powerful in novel situations, so places where we're unfamiliar, um, but it also exerts a very strong influence in um, private situations. So for example, at home or, or in a hotel room. And there are different types of norms, so we differentiate between an injunctive norm and a descriptive norm. So the injunctive norm is what you think people approve of, so people will like me if I do this, and the descriptive norm is what's common and what other people actually do themselves. All right, so with that backdrop, um, to talk about a field implementation that we did with a local hotel. So this was, if we skip to the next one, so this was um, a local hotel. They had both uh, a hotel and also a timeshare facility. I'm going to report the data from the, the timeshare, um, but we had similar results from the hotel as well. And like many hotels, they had developed and implemented a towel reuse program, and this was the existing message that they had. Uh, so help us conserve our natural resources. Do you need fresh towels? If you'd like your towels replaced, please leave your used towels in the basket. Towels left hanging on the towel rack tell us that you wish to reuse them. Using towels more than once saves hundreds of pounds of detergents and thousands of gallons of water each year. So it's an environmentally framed message and it's an educational message about the 
him about the program. So go to the next one. So what we wanted to do is to create an alternative message that use this social norms based platform. So our message is this. Many of our guests have expressed to us their approval of conserving energy. So the approval piece is that injunctive norm. When given the opportunity, nearly 75% of hotel guests choose to reuse their towels each day. That's the descriptive norm. Because so many of guests value conservation and are in the habit of conserving, this hotel has initiated a conservation program. So it's not that the hotel is pushing it on you, it's that the guests have demanded it and the, the resort is responding. So go to the next one. So we created these uh, in-room displays. We posted them in close proximity to where the behavior took place. So we put them in the bathroom next to the towels themselves. Next one. And then we worked with the cleaning staff to count how many towels came out of each room. So this data that I'm reporting here comes from 132 of the condo units from the timeshare facility. We have a separate study, a series of studies with the, the hotel facility. And we randomly assign the rooms to either get our experimental message or to have the, the existing message that they had used in the past, the control message. Uh, we had a total of 794 guest stays. Uh, each stay here is one week because this is the, uh, the timeshare facility. Uh, when we did the hotel, uh, we had to exclude guests that stayed for just one night. And the staff then counted the number of towels that were taken from each room. The rooms were stocked with four large bath towels, and so that was our focus. So this is a continuous measure from zero to four. Next slide shows our results. So the control message, which is there on the right, had an average of 2.3 towels that were removed and in comparison to the norm message the rooms had an average of 1.7 towels removed so that difference turns out to be a 25 percent reduction in the number of towels used uh, and then some more statistical data there and I'm happy to send the, the full paper if you're interested in reading about the results but this reduction of 25 percent is fairly consistent across the other uh, hotel applications that we had done. So basic conclusions then, our results here show that these social norms based messages can cause behavior change. Uh, we have other data that show that people generally don't perceive them as motivational. So when you ask them, uh, people say, well, yes, it was interesting to know, but I wasn't really affected by it, uh, when in fact they were and that it can apply to both private behavior. So in this case, um, reusing a towel in your hotel room is a fairly private behavior, uh, but also to public behaviors. But there's a problem here in the application. That is that the awareness campaigns often implement this norms-based approach incorrectly by highlighting the fact that it's the norm to do the undesirable behavior. So next slide. Uh, I see this as a, a very promising strategy. We published these results um, several years ago, and we're now looking for hotel partners that would be interested in uh, adopting and implementing and testing these types of messages on a larger scale. Um, we have some funding for this. Um, the funding that we have is especially for New York State, but uh, could also be national as long as there was a New York representation. And so if anyone is on the webinar and has an interest in partnering with us to develop and, and test some of these norms-based messages, we would love to do it. My email is listed there, uh, wschultz at csusm.edu. Next slide uh, just shows, right, I'm an academic, so I'm peddling my, my publications, but uh, we have quite a few publications on this topic, and if people are interested, I'm happy to send uh, copies of these academic papers. Thank you so much, Dr. Schultz. Those were some really interesting results about social norms. So 
We'll take questions that you may have about the study or anything else you'd like to ask Dr. Schultz. And remember that you should enter your questions via the chat box in your GoToWebinar panel. Well, people are feeling pretty quiet today, so there aren't there aren't any questions for you. Yes. <laughs> so you can still feel free to, if questions come up, you think of enter them as as they come, and we'll still answer any additional questions that come in um, later. So we just got a question in from Val Campbell. She is wondering if there are more examples of suggested messaging that you could use, I guess probably related to the the social norms. Right, so thinking about different types of messages, I mean we've tested different messages in hotel rooms and there are a couple other studies from, from colleagues of mine. Um, what we often find is that that environmentally based message, right, do it to protect the environment, do it to conserve natural resources, doesn't produce behavior change. And there's a lot of of argument about why that is, but in terms of promoting conservation, the environmentally based messages don't seem to have an effect. Um, certainly it can aid in, in branding, it can aid in developing uh, you know, the, the idea that the hotel or the resort is committed to sustainability, but in terms of behavior change we don't see it. Um, in, with regard to the social norms message, there have been some other studies for example, that look at should the norm be about the hotel, right, so other guests who have stayed in this resort, uh, should the norm be about the region, or maybe should the norm should even be about that room, right, so you can say X percent of guests who have stayed in this room uh, choose to reuse their towels. Um, and our recommendation from, from the research is to keep it generic about the resort, so it, it's partly facilitates branding, but also facilitates the norm or the custom of that particular hotel facility. So people that are coming there, they might not know, they're not from that area, and so it creates this somewhat ambiguous situation, and then the norm message can really be influential. So are there any other types of signs where you think that you could incorporate social norms outside of a towel reuse in a hotel? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the norm-based approach has been used in, in a lot of different areas. So, um, you know, thinking about what is the behavior that you're trying to target. And, and these are largely guest-based behaviors, right? So what is it that we want people to do while they're staying in our facility that will result in conservation? So you can think about limiting shower length, for example. And I know our next speaker is going to talk about uh, a program around that, not necessarily one that uses social norms, but in terms of a, a good behavior that could be targeted um, in the room. So developing, you know, a priority of specific guest behaviors that you would want to promote or change, and then creating a message platform around those. Great. And it sounds like, you know, you could also incorporate social norms into your employee outreach, you know, think of employee behaviors that you want to change and use social norms to help encourage those. Yes, and especially the idea that other people will disapprove of you if you don't do it. Mm -hmm. right? so that, that message tends to be very strong for, for that audience. Very interesting. And just to confirm, with the, the study for the towel reuse, all of the cards were placed in the bathroom next to the towels? That's right, and, and that's our recommendation is the idea that you want the message to, to occur in close proximity to the behavior. Now, you could have multiple messages, right? So if you're using a, a, a branding platform that's across the resort, so you have messages at check-in, and you have messages in, in the welcome book, and you have a message in the, the bathroom itself near the behavior. Mm -hmm. But it's that last one that really drives the behavior change, so that it's in close proximity. Great. Well, thank you again, Wes. I think that's all the questions we have for now, but we'll let you know if anything else comes up later on in the presentation. Great. Thank you. So now Alec 
Bartolai will provide a case study on his water conservation educational efforts at the Kalalak Lodge at Olympic National Park. Alec? Thanks, Laura. Can you hear me? We can. You sound great. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Yep, like Laura said, I'm, I'm Alec Bartolai. I'm the environmental manager out here at Kalalak Lodge, and, and we're in Olympic National Park. Next slide. So just to give you a little information about Claylock, uh, we're located 35 miles south of Forks on a bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean, Forks being famous for a twilight, uh, as most of the people know of it. Uh, we're on the coastal strip of Olympic National Park. Olympic National Park is that big green uh, blob on the screen, and then there's a little strip that goes all the way up the coast. Um, we're almost due west of Seattle, so if you just go straight from Seattle to the Pacific Ocean on a straight line. Uh, it's about 190 total miles. Um, the lodge itself is um, owned uh, by the National Park Service and is run uh, by Delaware North Parks and Resorts as a concessions contract. And uh, the, the hardest thing about Claylock is actually saying it. It's actually pronounced Claylock. The first A is, is silent. And it means a good place to land in the Quinault language. Next slide. So just some specific information about our lodge and our property. We have 64 total guest units. Um, that includes the actual 10-unit lodge, a 10-unit motel, uh, 44 cabins. The cabins range from one bedroom to four bedrooms. Almost all of them have a, a full kitchen uh, on 12 plus acres. And we also have a group campsite that holds uh, 30 people. Um, we have a full service restaurant, 106 seats, breakfast, lunch, dinner. We also have a mercantile kind of sundry store that sells camping supplies, groceries, uh, propane, wood, and then a gift store in our lobby. Um, on average, we get about 16,000 room nights a year, um, a total of about 60,000 retail transactions. Um, and we're kind of uh, remote out here, so we see that about 400,000 annual visitors, um, probably about three quarters of those visit our lodge. Uh, walk from the lodge down to the beach, use our restrooms, things like that. Um, we are a somewhat seasonal property. Our employees range from 30 in the off season, in kind of the off season, the winter and the fall, to 70 um, June, July, August. Uh, because we are remote, we have a number of employees that actually live on property, and so we do have a associate housing as well. Next slide. So some of the unique things that uh, call for water conservation out here at, uh, at Claylock. Um, we're in a temperate rainforest ecosystem. Um, all three um, temperate rainforests in the lower 48 states are within 30 miles of Claylock. Um, so in order to preserve that, that really unique ecosystem, water conservation is really vital to, to having all that moss and, and uh, vegetation. Um, we have a local National Park Service water treatment plant that is, is pretty undersized. It was built to, to deal with the ranger station and some campgrounds on a very, very small uh, lodge at the time. And over time, we've added a number of more cabins, uh, expanded the lodge, added the motel. Um, and so it's pretty well undersized. Um, there's lots of concerns about in the National Park running uh, a water treatment plant, the amount of energy and chemical use. Um, and so saving water uh, factors into that. And because of that, we have a pretty high and somewhat variable cost of water, um, anywhere between 20 cents and 35 cents a cubic foot. And then lastly, um, with the contract, uh, the concession contract we have with the National Park Service, we have some written, we've written into some, some metrics um, to reduce water. So 33% by 2016 and 40% by 2020. Next slide. So the first thing that a guest will see when they enter one of our rooms is kind of uh, some initial guest uh, literature. And we've used this water is vital, water is vital in so many ways um, uh, slogan in a number of different uh, ways. So we have this uh, trifold that folds into three parts uh, that kind of talks about some of our environmental initiatives, some of our commitments, and kind of educates some of our guests to the problems we're facing. One whole side is devoted to water conservation, our goals, uh, why it's important, what they can do to help, and what we're doing. Um, 
When they step into our bathroom, uh, they'll see a shower hang tag. It just hangs on the door. Uh, talking again about water is vital, um, conserving water with one step. And that's our towel reuse program, just telling a guest to, if they wish to uh, reuse their towel, they can just put it up on the rack. Um, if they want a clean towel, they can place it on the floor. On the back side of that are some just helpful hints to save water, um, turning off water and brushing teeth, lower the, uh, reduce the length of their shower or bath. Um, on our bedrooms, in our, on our beds, we have a linen reuse card. So the, that card in the, the lower left there, again, with the water is vital, just telling them that if they want their um, beds to be remade, they need to put that card on their bed during their stay. The default for us is to just remake the beds um, rather than change all the linens. Um, and then we also have a faucet card just for kindly reminding guests to report any sort of leaks um, and again with that water is vital message. Next slide. So uh, coupled with the kind of the initial guest communication, we also have an initial associate communication. Uh, all associates are trained when they're first hired on and then once a season. Um, and what we've done is we're obligated to give everyone safety training, orientation training, and we provided, uh, we've coupled our environmental training along with that. And our goal with kind of this initial training is to really explain the issues, the environmental problems we face to our associates and really introduce them to our goals. So we, we do a did you know about the amount of rain we get, the fact that we're in a temperate rainforest, and introduce them to that 33% reduction and 40% reduction by 2020. Next slide. So we then uh, provide some additional uh, training, uh, not only in the uh, kind of the environmental group training, but as department specific. Um, we target both our kitchen and housekeeping with some specific training. Our goal is to really get people to have general leak awareness, to report leaks, and also to kind of stop bad habits, things like flushing before they begin cleaning, uh, running water when they're de-thawing uh, meat, um, you know, running water when they're just generally cleaning as well. Our goal with this training is, is really uh, to introduce the associates to kind of um, what we're going to do and how associates can help. So we say we're going to have uh, low flow or high efficiency fixtures, our linen reuse program, we educate our gas, and we have uh, water timers, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, and then for our guests, we tell them some things that they can do to help um, reducing flushing, promoting the linen reuse, um, use water like you're camping. We have a very outdoorsy kind of uh, associate uh, group, and so they 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 grab onto that. Um, reporting leaks, um, we serve water upon request only in our in our restaurant. The thawing meat and, and water, we 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 encourage them to thaw it in the refrigerator and just shorten their shower lengths. Next slide. So I alluded to the shower uh, timer. Um, so because we not only have our cabins, but we also have a number of associates on property, what we've done is uh, we went out and bought these very um, kind of simple egg timers that, that count off five minutes. Installed them all the guest rooms, all associate housing. They just measure out five minutes. Um, and along with it, we have developed this five-minute shower challenge. And we have this little interp card that we put on every single one of these timers. Just challenging our guests, our associates that live on property to, to meet the five-minute challenge, um, informing them what the average amount of shower length is and, and seeing if they can beat it. Um, it's been really great to get guests and associate buy-in. It's kind of fun. It's challenging. People uh, talk about the five-minute challenge. And again, we, we go back to that water is vital, please conserve messaging. Next slide. One of the other initiatives that, that we have uh, committed to here is uh, just landscaping. Um, even though we are in the, in the rainforest, we do have pretty dry summers. And so it's important to kind of have native species for us um, in, in our general landscaping, uh, removing the, just moving away from turf grass and, and moving towards beach grass and some of those other native species out here. Um, so we have a landscaping plan to, to include that. Uh, we also have some hanging baskets and, and uh, under eave plants. And what we've done is we've purchased rain barrels. We've plumbed our gutters. And in this case here, we've actually plumbed our uh, water, um, our ice machine into it as well. 
Um, and that's been really great in saving water on property. Um, but we also communicate that, you know, we got a lot of guests walking up to it trying to figure out what it is. Um, and so we have this little plaque on it telling them about the issues of water conservation in the park and telling them that the, the rain barrels conserve uh, hundreds of gallons each year. And they've been very successful because we can literally just hang our plants on it and, and drip water them um, over, even, over the evening. Next slide. So one of the other places where we, we've um, taken on a number of initiatives is in a restaurant. Um, we've replaced our pre-rinse valve with a 0.65 uh, gallon per minute unit. We went with a very aggressive unit um, just because um, we get a lot of um, grime and stuff on our dishes and, and wanted to use something with a pretty high efficiency. Um, we have a high efficiency di dishwasher as well, Energy Star qualified. And I also alluded to that water on request only. Um, we had a number of guests that when served water weren't drinking any of it. We had to basically throw that water down the drain and then rewash the dish. And uh, we started the water served on request only and uh, somewhere in the range of about 50% less water um, being served out of the restaurant because of it. Next slide. So a couple other things that we've done with high efficiency appliances in addition to our pre-rinse valve. Um, been very, very aggressive with um, changing out faucet aerators both in our bathroom and our kitchen. Uh, we went down to a 0.5 gallon per unit. Uh, unit. Uh, it's been really successful in, in the bathroom. Um, we've also done it in our kitchen. I'm not sure I'd quite recommend going that low in the kitchen, um, but in many cases for us, guests are just washing out their coffee cups and, and so it, it's worked out. Um, we've also installed a number of high efficiency toilets in our cabins, Seacrest, and associate housing. Um, our goal is to change out all of our toilets, um, but we started off at kind of the oldest toilets, the toilets that were using three to four gallons per flush. Um, and then kind of our, our, one of our more successful um, units or things that we, uh, we've accomplished here is our high efficiency shower heads. And so across the board we had um, 2.5 to 3 gallon um, per minute units in all of our cabins. We brought that down to a 1.5 gallon per minute unit. Next slide. So in, you know, in order to communicate all of these um, initiatives that we've done, we've been very, very aggressive um, using social media, using blogs, using our website um, to communicate what we've done. It's also um, the website, social media blogs are, are oftentimes the first um, interaction guests have with us. And so one of the things that we've done is on our website we have our commitments to preserve and protect uh, a special places. We talk about our environmental management system, we talk about some of our environmental initiatives, and we also give uh, guests some things they can do to help. And it kind of introduces them to the fact that uh, environmental conservation here is really important at Claylock. Um, we're really aggressive with Facebook. Um, every Sunday we do a Sustainable Sunday post. Many of them are devoted to, to kind of water conservation. So this is just uh, one blog that we did on uh, our H2O challenge. Um, once a month we also have a blog um, just talking to kind of our guests and, and some of our what we call Claylock groupies um, about what we do here, what's going on, and we do a lot of, of ones on our environmental initiatives. So we have one on going greener. Um, we also communicate um, our environmental initiatives through some certifications. We're NSF uh, certified to ISO 14001. Uh, we are a green leader at the gold level. And on an annual basis, uh, Delaware North puts out a, a CSR report, and we have our own page talking about all of our initiatives and what guests can do to help. Next slide. So through all of these initiatives, through all of this communication, we've seen some pretty significant results. Um, Delaware North took on the operations in late September 2012 and we've been tracking our results ever since. We also have the data for the um, rolling 12 months before then. Um, and you can see that the uh, light blue and dark blue are kind of um, what was going on in 2013, or 2011 and 2012 and the green is 2013. Um, somewhere in the range of 20% to 50% reduction every month, uh, especially during our busy summer season. 
Um, on top of this, we've seen a pretty significant decrease in the water consumption per occupied room. You know, over this time period, we, we saw about 10% increase in our occupancy. So in addition to, to reducing our overall consumption 40%, um, our water consumption per room went down from about 200 gallons per room to about 100 uh, over the course of that year. Um, and we also track it uh, not only against um, the previous rule in 12 months, but against a, a baseline year that the Park Service has given us. Uh, as well as uh, just calendar years. And you can see that 40% reduction over kind of the previous year, 40% uh, reduction over the baseline, 36% over year over year. And all of these initiatives have saved us a, a, a number of, a lot of money, about $39,000 at our average prices. It would have been a more, uh, the, our prices actually went down over the course of the year fairly significantly, um, in large part because we were saving so much water. Um, this is something that we've communicated to our, get, our associates. Um, they're very keen to see how much money we've saved. Um, we are some, you know, very seasonal. Um, and so by keep, uh, saving all that money, we've actually been calculated, we've been able to keep on an additional one to two employees to help support all of our initiatives. So um, they've been very keen to see that number. Next slide. So one of the most important things that we've done is really communicate the results. It's all one, it's one thing just to, to do it, but we want to make sure that our guests, our associates, the National Park Service know what's going on. So we've monitored and measured our water consumption on a monthly basis. We've compared our numbers to the baseline. We share it with our guests, associates through signs, newsletters. We actually have a posting, um, two similar postings, one in our guest lobby, the other one for our associates. It gives the graphs, it tells um, how we're doing relative to our goals year over year, uh, some initiatives we've taken on and what guests can do. And then from a um, associate standpoint, we have the same posting, but we replace um, the right-hand side with accomplishments by department. And we go department by department. Um, we've found that it's very um, beneficial for our associates. They want to know what their specific department has done to meet those goals. Um, in addition to that, we've also kept them updated on our contract goals. How close are we? And we met our goals uh, almost a full seven years ahead of schedule. Ultimately, we've used these initiatives and we've used these data to keep informing um, on further water conservation initiatives and just kind of see how effective our programs have been. Next slide. So just kind of the additional lessons we've learned over, over uh, the last, uh, well, the 14 months or so um, that we were tracking there. Um, we wanted to keep our message simple. We've used this water is vital, please conserve a number of times um, through various multiple means. Um, we've communicated that message multiple times, um, different people. So we've kept that message simple, but we tweak it whether we're going to a guest, to an associate, or the National Park Service. Um, our goal with not only our guests, but also our associates, is to reinforce good habits, stop bad habits. Um, we want to kind of reward them for doing the right thing, not necessarily kind of shame them on, on bad things. Um, we use lots of pictures. Um, we have uh, associates that speak a variety of different languages. Some are not uh, the most literate. Um, so, you know, most guests or most associates really pick up on the faucet that's leaking and a big ax through it. Or the piggy bank with the water, um, realizing that water is money and its um, ability to, to save the company. Um, our goal, too, is, is really update stakeholders. We found that really important. Um, along the way, we've updated our graphs, showing them month by month how we're doing, where we stand, what they've done that specific month to help us along the way. Uh, and people have gotten into it. How much money have we saved? Um, they, they see that as a, as a great way to kind of ensure their viability there. Um, we provide the specific accomplishments by department. And kind of most of all, we've, we've made it fun. It's really a source of pride. Um, a number of our associates came on from a previous concession company. Um, and this is something they weren't doing in the past. And the fact that we've been able to meet our contractual goals, save so much money, save so much water has really been a source of pride for our employees. Kind of lastly, um, we pilot a number of our initiatives. We started off small, 
sometimes we'd start off just in our um, associate housing, sometimes we'd start off in just a handful of cabins, see if it was working, see if it was working with housekeeping and our guests, and if it did, we expanded it. Um, and one of the things that we're actually expanding beyond the realm of Claylock is our shower timers, um, with California being in a drought, are, are expanding to our Yosemite operations. Next slide. So if you guys have questions for me, um, that's my contact information. And just a beautiful picture I took. I like to promote my, my pictures. It is beautiful, and the whole area looks beautiful. Congratulations, Alec, to you and the rest of your Claylock team. You guys achieved incredible results very quickly. Yeah, don't let it get out that you saved all of it in two years. Don't make you... <laughs> Who knows what they'll make you try to do next, but it's a great accomplishment. So if you have any questions about Alex's case study, please feel free to enter them into the chat box. So Alex, one question for you. You said that you were transferring some of these um, best practices to Yosemite. Are there other things other than the shower timers that you guys are transferring over, or is it just that? Yeah. Um, we, we've transferred over a lot of the um, uh, just water-saving um, appliances, the high-efficiency appliances, so particularly in our Yosemite operations. They've been very, very aggressive with low flow fixtures, um, the high efficiency toilets, the high efficiency shower heads. One thing they weren't doing were, were the shower timers, and that was something to, to really get the engagement. Um, some of our other operations, we operate in Shenandoah National Park as well as in uh, Yellowstone. A lot of the communication um, has um, transferred over. Um, we're getting more and more of our sites using Facebook and social media to kind of communicate what they're doing. Um, a lot of our guests are repeat guests as well as in our other, other sites. And so that's been very successful as kind of a transferred um, initiative. Cool. Um, we also have a question. Um, have you had any problems with the shower timers breaking or getting stolen? Um, you know, we, we, the shower timers have been kind of a trial and error uh, process. We, we started off with a digital one. Uh, the digital one didn't work particularly well for us. Uh, they got water behind them. We ended up having bad batteries. Um, they weren't very reliable. The mechanical ones, the ones that are just basically egg timers, have worked much better. Um, we have had some taken away from the rooms, um, but we kind of take that as a source of pride that the guests really liked it that much that they took it. Um, we are getting more and more guests actually coming to our front desk asking to purchase them out of the rooms. Mm, um, interesting. They have, they have teenage boys at home taking long showers, and um, they want to kind of bring that challenge to the household. Neat. That's pretty cool. And do you then, do you sell them to them? Yeah, we do. Um, we, we've started keeping a couple extra um, just to, to sell. Yeah, you could slap the logo on there. And yeah, have souvenir. Souvenirs. Well, it looks like those are all the questions for now. Thank you again, Alec, for sharing your Lodge's efforts through education. Yeah, it's been really great. Great example. Thanks. So now I'm just going to turn it back over to Tara for a review of what we talked about in today's webinar. All right. Thank you again, Alec, for that very informative case study with the great pictures. And thank you also to Dr. Schultz for sharing the findings of your study and how the guests react to different types of messaging. I can see how that and the other uh, materials that you provided will be very helpful for people as they're trying to figure out these uh, which behaviors they want to target and how to best get people to act on them. So to review what we covered today, I just wanted to remind everyone how important, obviously, education and outreach is to your water conservation efforts. Um, basically, as you know, reducing water use in all of these places, such as the restrooms, laundries, and landscapes, can't really happen without the employee education and the cooperation of your guests. Um, it's really important to educate everyone at the hotel, as we mentioned. Um, from your senior senior management all the way down to your guests about all of the goals that you've uh, that you're trying to achieve and strategies that you're trying to use 
Um, and don't forget any vendors or other uh, companies that you outsource to because they can be a very good source of uh, continuing that savings outside just the footprint of your facility. Um, and as some of our challenge participants have learned, one of the best ways to get employees to take ownership of water savings is to encourage them with incentives or to provide them with fun ways such as shower timers uh, to really get involved in the effort and also um, to give them some responsibility for developing some ideas and implementing some projects themselves. And as Dr. Schultz mentioned, when it comes to educating guests, the type of message that you use can really help uh, to inform them about your water saving efforts and can make all the difference in whether they participate or not. Likewise, uh, the Claylock Lodge really made a great effort to educate and engage the employees and guests while really significantly reducing the facility's water use. I think we would all be very happy to meet our goals in two years um, and to have such great successes to build on. So finally, you, can't, you can work with your hotel guests using the free tools provided by WaterSense and our partners, um, and many of those are available on our website. And if you are, we covered a lot of great topics today, so if you're wondering where to get started, um, here are just a few tips for what you can do right now to improve the education and outreach about water savings at your hotel. Um, the biggest one that we talk about is really fixing and reporting leaks. Um, you know, it's one of the most obvious, but it is often forgotten. Um, you know, really posting signs and conducting education to tell people to report them and then actually fixing them as soon as possible can really help to keep things running smoothly. If you don't have a towel or linen reuse program, start one. If you do, check your messaging. Is it using the tips we learned from Dr. Schultz today about normalizing behavior of reusing your towels or is it something else? Um, and talk to your housekeeping staff. Is it the is the first flush before washing the toilet really necessary or could it be replaced by a swish? And your kitchen staff, if you're using cold water to thaw food, see if they can find a better way to do that while meeting health codes. And finally, starting an employee green team um, and like some of our other hotel challenge participants is a really great way uh, to involve employees and really get everyone's buy-in into the process and can um, you know, get a surprising result from just giving uh, people a, a point of pride in their work um, ad in addition to the things that they normally do as part of their jobs. Um, and it really helps, um, once again, to give some incentives and some ownership so that people can really come up with these great ideas, because um, many of them have them, to save water and other efficiencies along the way. So you can get started now by promoting your water savings efforts. All you have to do if you haven't yet is take the pledge on our website and uh, you'll get all the information about these webinars um, as well as the other ones that we've done. We have our next webinar coming up that's focused on commercial kitchen savings um, and that's where we'll talk about some of the technologies that are, you know, steamer systems, ovens, um, uh, cookers, food disposal systems, pre spray valves, etc. Um, and we'll be having a case study on as well from a different hotel. And then uh, we also, as we mentioned, we've rec we're recording today's webinar and we've recorded several other webinars uh, throughout this year. Uh, they're all listed here on the slide and they're all available on our website. So you can take a look at those um, when you get a chance. There's a lot of really great information um, there as well. Um, and then we also have our water use tool uh, that can be used to plug in your information about your water rates and some of your uh, fixtures and then can give you a list of some things that you can start doing or a list to prioritize your efforts. Um, and then we also have several case studies that are posted, um, such as the ones that we'll be making from today's presentation. Um, the Caesars Entertainment one will hopefully be posted next week, I believe, but there are about five or ten of them so far that are available on the website for you to check out. So please, if you haven't yet, please visit our website at epa.gov slash watersense slash challenge, and you can get a bunch of tools, promotional materials, and just see what's going on in different hotels across the country. So before we wrap up, um, if there is anybody else on the call that has any questions, um, we, you know, we're still 
taking them in the chat box if you have them. Um, and if you have any information that you'd like to share or a case study about your own hotel's efforts, we'd love to hear about it. Um, if you type your information into the chat box and say that, that you know, we'd be more than happy to contact you and get some information from you um, to include you in some of these things. Um, and then also, uh, can, there, we do have one question. I'll just stop there for a second. It says, can someone tell us what they do with unused towels left in the bathrooms after the guests leave? Are those replaced and washed or left for the next guest? Um, my sense based on health codes is that most likely all of the towels that are left in the room when the room transfers to a different um, guest is probably has to be washed um, as part of the health code. But I think the point of these um, programs is to reduce the number of towels that people go through during their particular stay. Um, that's why they, I believe that they used a three-day stay minimum for the study that was done. Is there, Dr. Schultz, do you have any other thoughts on that? You're still there? No, no that, that's my understanding as well. So it's really looking at those longer-term stays. So our focus in the data I reported was on the timeshare facilities where mm -hmm. people stay but um, even if they stay only uh, two nights there's still an opportunity to reuse and for conservation yeah and I think that's something that you know with all of these efforts obviously local and state health codes apply in some areas that do limit the things that we can do um, you know such as if you do provide a glass of water to a, um, a a guest at a restaurant, you have to then wash that bit, that before you can give it to another guest. So we're trying to, you know, find the ways that we can, obviously we don't want to make anyone sick or do anything illegal. So um, finding ways that we can find those savings um, in the meantime. And then uh, there's another question. Um, has there ever been a program to provide towels in a room based on the occupancy of the room? For example, one person gets one set, two people in the room gets two, thus preventing the extra towels from being wasted or never or from getting washed and never used. So it's something that you've seen, Dr. Schultz? I haven't seen it. I mean, obviously certain types of rooms come with more towels than others, so depending on the, the bed configuration or the room configuration and so forth. But in terms of actually adjusting it in the room after the guest checks in, I haven't I haven't seen that type of program. Yeah, but I could see how the adjusting it to the number of beds would probably be a pretty good rule of thumb for those particular you know for facilities that have multiple configurations. That's great. All right, I think that um, that is all the questions we've gotten so far. Um, we're just going to do a little quick poll at the end here, just we're trying to figure out how useful our webinars actually are as we continue to do them. We hope that they're useful, but it's always nice to have that reassurance. So if you could uh, take a minute and vote, um, that'll help us as we plan future webinars. Um, and also, if you have ideas for future things that you'd like to hear about or um, case studies, as I mentioned, or different programs that you'd like to tell us about, we'd love to hear about it. Um, you know, we're at the point where we're kind of collecting all of this information so that we can disseminate it out to others around the country and give people more ideas um, of things that they can do near them. So we're happy and open to all suggestions um, if you have them, uh, especially, you know, if you've got case studies and other ideas that you'd like to share. And that is a great result. We have uh, eight, almost 80% of you that said that you will start using this information right now, which is what I love to hear. Makes us <laughs> glad to hear that it's useful to you. So feel free, um, as we mentioned, today's uh, webinar was recorded, and we're going to be posting it on the WaterSense website along with the others. Uh, so you'll receive an email when it's available. And we really encourage you, if there are others that you work with or other colleagues that you know of that may be interested in the today's topic or any of the others, feel free to share that with anybody. The more, the merrier. Um, you know, we're really trying to get the word out to as many people as possible. So uh, thank you again for your participation today. You guys have been a really great group. And thank you again to our awesome presenters. And we look forward to talking to you again on, on some of our upcoming webinars. 
Have a great afternoon.